All right, good afternoon. Today's lecture from the Contending for the Faith book is going to be on praying on the armor of God. So before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I do pray and ask that not only would you bless this lecture, but you bless the hearers. I pray that you'd strengthen us, encourage us, and then, Lord, you would just work your perfect will in our lives. Grant us wisdom and knowledge liberally, upbraideth it not. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. All right. In con coming into this subject on praying on the armor of God, we need to understand that the armor of God is a spiritual armor. We are made up of not only physical bodies, but we also have spirits. There's an entire spiritual world around us. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, the Lord tells us, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In other words, trust in God and what he will do for you. But he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So, the armor is designed to help us stand against the schemes or the schemata of the devil. Uh, the devil literally speaks about the one who's, whose desire is to make us do our own will or to, to veer from the will of God. The word devil is a transliteration into the English through the Latin, which would be D hyphen evil, to do evil. And it means to choose to do your own will. Anytime we veer from the will of God, we are doing evil. So the armor of God is to keep us standing in, positionally in the will of God the Father and in honoring Jesus Christ. He says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So, this wrestle, and it's, it's the word agonizo, and it's used for two people that are exhausting themselves, one trying to throw the other down. So we have enemies that are going to try to wrestle us from the path of righteousness. These enemies are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness. In a later uh, lecture, I'm going to teach on the 11 different types of angels and their influence and the effect they can have upon us. Today, I want to talk about the armor of God. The armor is designed so that we can stand against the attack and the onslaught of the enemy. It's to keep us positionally in Jesus Christ. You see, the, the day that you became a child of God, a Christian, and the Holy Spirit entered you, you became targeted by the devil. The enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ are now your enemies. The world, with its philosophies, its deceits, its, its own self-will, the devil, and your own flesh will try to get you to turn against Christ and his righteousness. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 15 warns us that those who seek to depart from evil will make themselves a prey. And that's why if you try to live righteously, you are going to suffer for it. You are going to come under attack. He says also, Yea, true, truth faileth. He that parteth from evil maketh himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. See, God wants us to judge. And by judging, it means to weigh out what's right and what's wrong, what's pleasing unto God, and what is self-willed or selfish. So we're to be judging that. We're to be living in the truth, and we're to separate from evil. Job was a righteous man because he eschewed, and that means he stayed away. He did not travel with the evil that was around him. He separated from it. So if you seek to live righteously, the Bible says 
that you are going to become under persecution and a prey. The Bible describes our enemy as a roaring lion that seeks to devour the children of God. One of the things that's, that's interesting about a lion's roar is it can be heard up to two miles away. When a person is actually close within the proximity of the lion, 10-15 feet, and the lion roars directly at them, they say that the, the actual decibel levels, the, the force of the roar itself, will cause you to freeze. It overrides your instincts and the brain itself will just freeze up because of terror and fear. A lion's roar is incredibly powerful. And when the person freezes or stands, then the lion can easily run in and take them. But you see, when we stand and we have the armor of God, he can't get to us. He may make us afraid at times, he may be roaring about us and bringing terror at times upon us. But God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. He gives us the spirit of peace, a sound mind, and love. So God's armor will protect us from the roaring of the, of the lion. It will protect us from the schemes of the devil. And it will keep us standing positionally in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, that, that's our ultimate desire, is to be in God's will. And to, to not only be in God's will, but to stand in righteousness so that others will see us as a light set on a hill. And not only a light on a hill, but a city that is inviting. In other words, people will want to become a part of Christian, the Christian life. They will want to accept Christianity and Jesus Christ as their Lord because of your witness. Um, I speak in the, the book on page 60 about how when an Indian made an arrow, they expected it to hit. It would take sometimes a full day to make a single arrow. They were very valuable. My father, who trained me in hunting and, and how to shoot various weapons, he always called the arrow silent death because you wouldn't hear the arrow being discharged. And the only thing you would hear is the thud after you felt the chest or the body part getting struck. When an enemy seeks to injure somebody, they will seek to, to make every strike count. When I would watch the old western shows, there would be hundreds of arrows flying over the wall of the fort. The cows, cowboys and the citizens would be hiding in the fort behind the wooden walls. The Indians would be sailing the walls and just shooting mirages of arrows. But that's not true life. True life, and I remember talking to an old Indian, and he is the one that pointed out when they would make an arrow and it would take a whole day, they would not fire it unless they intended for it to hit dead on their target. And because that arrow was very valuable. Our enemy is going to be shooting fiery darts at us. He's going to try to take us down with those hits. He's not going to just fire them so that we are alerted to his presence but when we are assaulted it's going to be in such a way that the enemy tries to cripple us or to bring us down and we need to realize that we do have enemies our enemies are not the people that we work with they're not people on the streets they're not people of varying opinions and stuff but they're actually spiritual enemies there are angels that have been cast down demons if you will the first is principalities. A principality is one that actually rules over a region or an area. I'm going to go into this in greater detail when I speak on demonology in a future lecture. But our first enemy is against a principality. And that's because you're living in the area of ground or terrain that he is over. He is a ruler over that area and he has all the angelic demons of darkness under his command. And because you are in his territory, he is going to target you because you are an enemy. He does not want you influencing anyone for the kingdom of light. He does not want you speaking the truths of Christ. He doesn't want you preaching the gospel. He doesn't want you praying. He wants to make it so that you are ineffective. He wants to take you a prisoner and snare you so that he can destroy your life. 
The second one is against powers. Now powers are those that have the ability. They're demonic angels that have the ability to change things around you. They can affect people so that their attitudes towards you are not pleasant or that they will just not like you. They, they have the ability to affect the way that you work or your workplace, your finances. Powers have the ability to affect the things around you. The rulers of darkness of this present world. The rulers of darkness are those that rule over every aspect of the kingdom of darkness. There are many people that are inhabited by demons, they do not even know it, or that live in the kingdom of darkness. It really encompasses not only the world and its philosophical systems, but the inhabitants of the world. Rulers of darkness will seek to separate you from the light because they want to separate everyone from the truth of Jesus Christ and from the light of God. They try to bring darkness in and that means they blind your eyes to the truth and they cover your heart so it becomes insensitive. Also against the fourth one is spiritual wickedness in high places. Now this literally means the spirits that are being worshipped in, in that specific area. And believe it or not, witchcraft is very abundant. In churches today, you'll have many people that truly are not born again, but they are worshippers of false spirits like Baal or Ashtaroth or Isis, and they're goddess, and they give themselves over to it because they want signs and wonders and, and wickedness. Our battle is not against flesh and blood or against the people that are demonized. Our battle is against the spirits that control them and that manipulate them. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, And you who were dead, thanoi, that means separated from the power of God and his influence, hath he quickened, that means he's given you the life of the Holy Spirit and attached you to Jesus Christ. Where in times past you walked according to the concourse of this world. In the Greek, it literally means according to the manipulation and the influence of the demonic spirits of this world. So, we recognize that the reason why we need the armor is because we have a literal enemy that will seek to, to attack us, to destroy our lives, and to manipulate the things around us. So, we need the armor of God to stand against Satan, the devil, and their minions. Alright, the first thing I want you to understand is that God's holy armor is an armor of light. And by this, it means it has the explosive power within it to drive back the darkness. Light and darkness cannot coexist. The light will always drive the darkness out. We find in Romans chapter 13, verse 12, the Bible tells us the night is far spent. The day is at hand. That means we need to recognize the seriousness of our situations. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The armor of the, of the Lord God that we serve is a holy armor that will drive back the darkness. So the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us in Romans that time is short. Every moment on this earth is precious. And we need to get focused and take serious this battle between light and darkness and we need to put on the armor of light so that when we walk in this earth we are a light and we will drive back the darkness around us and that means in the people you meet the place where you work you can become a literal place where the power of God will work through and it will drive the darkness back you are the light of the world a light of the world, that means the light of the world of Jesus Christ is within you. You are a light bearer of Jesus Christ. And we find these verses in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, John 8, 12, also John 9, 5, and Matthew 5, 16. So we need to understand that we are soldiers who wear armor. And the armor that we wear is of light. It drives back the darkness. So, let's go ahead and get down to the armor a little bit more. And 
understand that by claiming the armor of God, we do so in such a way that we believe it is spiritual and it will be effective. Now, early in my ministry, um, I had an encounter, my first time I encountered an incubus. And I had a, a couple come to me to where they, the woman was being assaulted by a demon of hatred that would literally manifest physically and would sexually assault her. Her husband actually saw it and, and it was physically manifested and tried to pull it off her and it attacked him, uh, threw him around like a puppet, uh, even bit a chunk, you could see the, the teeth imprint in his chest, and then it finished sexually assaulting her. It was because they had cursed objects that were from a voodoo shop. <clears throat> now, I had asked if I could have permission to pray in proxy with authority for them. They said yes. So I started praying, and I always pray with my eyes open when I'm counseling. And instantly, the person's chair lifted in the air, with them on it. And you could see the force. They were pinned in the chair of something hitting her. And the, it was a massive force hitting her. And the husband ran um, because he knew what was there. And I cried out. I said, I command you to be bound in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she's screaming and the thing is still hurting her. And it, even though it only lasted a few seconds... I cried out, I said, Heavenly Father, would you grab it and not let it hurt her? And the chair went back down to the ground, and in front of me, I'll never forget it, it was about this tall, and it was a red and black scaled dragon humanoid uh, with red glowing eyes, and it manifested right in front of me. And I said, you don't have the authority to hit me, because I have the shield of faith. And it openly said, you have no faith. And he was right. I, I said, you're right. I'm terrified. And so I raised my hand and I said, Father, forgive me for being so afraid. Would you please place the shield of faith around me and help me to trust in you? And it's still there. And I then said, now do I have the shield of faith? And it said, yes. I said, why didn't you hit me? And he said, I don't have permission. I learned two things from that. First, that it's important when you're doing Christian counseling and going against demonic entities, it's important to pray on the armor of God. Not only for you, but for those in the room. Secondly, a demon cannot attack you or assault you unless it has permission. I remember um, the second church I was at was infiltrated by Satanists. They most people don't understand, but Satanists have to join Bible-believing teaching churches so they can undermine them from the inside. It's called subterfuge. And they try to become deacons. The women will try to be over the ministry of the nursery so they can curse the children. They will try to dress very sexual to cause the pastor to fall. And I had a deacon in my church that I didn't know it, but I later discovered was a high-level Satanist who had been sent with his wife to infiltrate the church and destroy it. And I had him over for dinner one day after church on Sunday and just out of the blue he says the curse without cause will not come. And I looked at him and I said uh, yeah that's right that's out of the book of Proverbs. And he puts his fork down and looks me in the eye very solemnly and says folds his hands and goes like this he goes you just have to find out what a person's sin problem is and then you can curse them. And it was incredible because it was very interesting that he would say that. But I had been praying and asking God to reveal what the problem was in the church. And it gave me a whole new light on the subject. He went back to eating and I, I thought of it. And then later on when I found out through his wife, she was repenting that they were members of the satanic coven of that region and of the one over that specific area. And they had been cursing the members of the church that they would intentionally cause people to sin and they would then curse them. They would do rituals and send demons against them. So an angel, a fallen angel, cannot do anything against you unless it has permission. Now they will get permission by causing you to have a specific sin because then God has to allow you to be judged. So, God, 
He says in verse 13, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And what this means is not just part of the armor. You have to take on the complete armor for complete protection, so that when everything around you is destroyed, when the world has fallen apart, you will still be standing there strong in the power of God and His might. He says, the first thing is, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. This is the belt of truth. It means that which will hold you together. And we need to understand, so we need to understand that God wants us to be held together by truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. And it's through the truth that we are set free. So we have to hold on to truth. It should be that which holds everything together in our life. That's why it's important to know God's promises, to, to trust in God's promises, to commit your ways unto him and allow him to bring things to pass. So the first thing I do is I would pray, Heavenly Father, I pray and ask that you place the, the girdle of truth about me. I ask that as you have set me free with the truth, and Lord Jesus Christ, you are the truth, the living truth, that today you would bless me with your truth, that I would stand in your truth, that I would embrace it, that I would be a living example, that my words would, would speak truth, and that my mouth and heart would only embrace that which is true. Keep me from lies, from deceit. The next is the breastplate of righteousness. I would pray, Heavenly Father, I pray that you put the breastplate of righteousness on me. The, the article of a priest, let me be your priest who seeks to be sanctified and separated by you unto holiness. Cover all of my organs. Take control of my emotions and my bowels. Let my heart seek righteousness. Let me live righteousness so I honor you, glorify you, and can minister to those around me. I pray and ask also that you would take it and cover my feet, prepare them, with the gospel of peace. Let me walk. And wherever I walk, let the, the impression and the essence of peace, the fragrance of peace, the presence of peace abound. I pray that it would quench the anger, the hatred, the variance, the emulations and the strife that I may meet. I pray that it would leave behind me a path that shows forth the peace and the truth of the living God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would next place the shield of faith that means a shield of commitment to you and of your power and works around me. That it would quench the fiery darts, which means those things that I have lusts for and passions, that you would not let me have improper lusts or passions, but rather my lust would be for you. I would hunger, thirst, lust for your righteousness, for your word, to live after you, so that it would quench the temptations that are the fiery darts of the enemy. Quench them as they try to entice me, to lead me astray. I pray that you would not allow me to be influenced by wickedness, but rather my heart would be sanctified and committed to you and your work. Cover me from my head to my feet, my front, my back, 365 degrees with a commitment to you. And Father, I pray lastly you would put the helmet of salvation upon me. That, Lord, I would trust in your salvation, the assurance of your word, the assurance of your presence, that my thoughts would be controlled by you. I pray this day that my mind would think of you, would think of your word, would submit to your will, would hear your leading, the voice of your Holy Spirit. Keep me solid in your salvation and in your grace. And then, Lord, equip me with the sword of the Spirit, which is your word. Let me always pray with all prayer and supplication in your spirit. And let me watch for myself and others with all pure perseverance and supplication for the saints. Because, Lord, it's a sin against you for me not to be praying for others. So I pray that you would give me utterance, that I would be able to open my mouth boldly, to make known the mysteries of the gospel to others, to be an ambassador to others, and that, Heavenly Father, I would seek to enrich them with your word as a member of your kingdom. That your word would be that which cuts through the world before me as a sharp two-edged sword, cutting between the bone and the marrow and the heart and the spirit and the soul. 
and that, Lord, as a holy soldier, soldier of yours, I would wear the armor of light, not only driving back the darkness, but, Lord, leading others to a commitment and a faith in you. I pray that this would be not only for me, but that as an ambassador, I would compel others to join into the kingdom of Christ and to take on the armor for the fight, the good fight of the faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's how I pray the armor on, and I trust each piece to do its part and to protect me. I pray this day that you will see the significance, the necessity of having God's armor on, especially if you're a counselor. I wrote a book called The Little Book of Prayers, and when you're in spiritual warfare, I've put prayers in there specifically to teach people how to pray against the matters of darkness. That book can be obtained through Amazon or any book dealer or through Kindle, Fire, but it has prayers in it to, to, for you, your family, your home, everything about you, to help you stand against the kingdom of darkness. I pray the Lord has blessed you in this lecture on praying on the armor of God. In Christ's name.